The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. And David, today we have Ambrose Evans Pritchard coming on with us here soon. And today he reported that Eurozone inflation surged to an all-time high. What's going to happen? So, Kevin, you have two competing camps. And the one camp centered in the European Central Bank is fixated on inflation, going back to its early days in the hyperinflation of the 1919 to 24 period, and again in in the late 40s. You have them hypersensitive, if you will, to the fact that their inflation rate is now twice the target rate, twice the target rate. So as leaders of the European Central Bank, in, in many regards, the likelihood is that they will raise interest rates on Thursday of this week. Now, what does that matter to the U.S. investor? Well, you have the folks at Morgan Stanley, You have the folks at the Royal Bank of Scotland. You have the folks at Barclays. You have the folks at Fortis, all looking for a significant decline in the stock market. Even the Bank of International Settlements. Exactly. And and they're basically looking at, at a crisis moment in Europe and with the euro and in their credit markets because the European Central Bank, when it maybe should follow the course of the Federal Reserve, lowering rates to accommodate a very fragile credit and banking system, is in fact inclined, given its historic nature, to raise rates and fight inflation. While we've been lowering rates. We've been lowering rates. So this is the great battle, Kevin, between competing ideas. On the one hand, you have folks that want to squash inflation because of where inflation can go, the developing exponential function. On the other hand, you've got the accommodation of the markets, the accommodation of the credit system, the accommodation of banking and credit. And so these are the competing ideas. We have our talk softly and carry a big stick going on as we speak. We just sent Paulson, the U.S. government sent Paulson over to lecture and, and speak to the European Central Bank. We've got Axel Weber and Jean-Claude Trichet who will get an earful from him in the next couple of days, basically telling them how they should operate just the way we have. Major conflict, which could turn into major turmoil in the financial markets here even within the next few days. Not just conflict across the ocean, but actually conflict right in the Eurozone itself. You've got France saying, no way, don't raise the rates. Inflation's not that bad right now. Then you've got the Germans, who historically are against inflation, having to come up to the bar right now and say, all right, are we going to raise rates and basically make enemies worldwide, or are we going to lower rates or keep them the same and allow for more inflation? With us today is Ambrose Evans Pritchard, the international business editor for The Telegraph in London. Ambrose was chief correspondent in Brussels following the development, up close and personal, of the European Union knows the intricacies of it, both from a political and an economic standpoint. Ambrose, does it look like the European Central Bank is going to raise rates on Thursday? And if so, what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, it looks as if they're almost certainly going to raise rates into the storm. They have not shifted their monetary stance at all since the credit crunch began in, in August. The Fed, as you know, has cut 325 basis points dramatically probably the most dramatic action by any central bank in modern times. The ECB has done nothing. And in fact, the monetary conditions here have tightened because the what we call Euribor, which is a real price used for contracts, has gone up by at least four points. So the actual mortgage costs for people in Spain and Ireland and and other countries has been rising and rising and rising into this crisis. So there's a big, big row going on in Europe at the moment. A lot of the politicians are getting extremely unhappy about this. The finance ministers in France, Spain, Italy, and now even Germany. And also, the, the Washington's very upset about it because the ECB raising rates in, in this climate is making it more difficult for the Federal Reserve to stabilize the dollar. And stabilizing the dollar has become extremely important because until we can stabilize the dollar, the price of oil is going to keep on shooting up. Oil is is effectively trading as a kind of inverse dollar. There's massive amounts of uh, investment funds pouring into the into the commodity as a kind of, if you like, was not exactly a safe haven, but as a kind of sort of refuge currency. I wouldn't call it a speculative trade exactly, but it's certainly huge amounts of money just piling into the into into oil every time there's sign of the dollar weakening further. And until this dynamic can be stopped, this is going to get worse and worse. 
And so for the ECB to be raising in this climate, it's causing a lot of anger in several places, and particularly in Washington. And it's a little bit like the row between the German Bundesbank and the Federal Reserve in 1987, when in the height of the crisis in October 87, the Bundesbank raised interest rates and therefore forced the whole of Europe to raise interest rates in lockstep and precipitated, as we now know, the stock market crash in October 87, which went, went around the whole world. Within a few weeks, the Bundesbank was forced to cut rates several times to undo the damage. And my own view is that the European Central Bank is probably going for overkill at this point, and then we'll have to backtrack dramatically. We thought we might talk today about how the U.S., might pull through this quite well in the final analysis, while well, you perhaps will not. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. obviously has got a, a very serious crisis at the moment, the, the, the collapse of the property market. Nothing quite like this has been seen, really, probably since the Great Depression. But my view is that it's not the only country with troubles. It's the first in, and it'll be the first out. Problems rotating now across the Atlantic. Britain's in very similar straits, but it's, it's in an earlier phase. The housing market is disintegrating here, following the same pattern we saw in the United States. The same is happening in Spain and Ireland. And I think it won't be long before we see this in quite large stretches of Eastern Europe, where there have been huge credit bubbles. And Italy's also in, in quite serious difficulties. And I think then we're going to see it in, in Asia. It's going to go in stages. You know, we got one bubble after another caused by this uh, long secular phase of credit expansion we've had for 15, 10, 15 years. All these bubbles are going to burst one by one. And I, I think the emerging market bubble is beginning to unwind, actually, as we speak. You've seen the Chinese stock market's already off by half. India suddenly lost its halo, and there's massive capital flight from India. You know, these were the two stars of the, um, of the emerging universe. And I think people are beginning to realize there's serious trouble there. So, and, and then the last shoe to drop, I think, will be the commodity countries like Russia. Okay, they've got huge revenues coming in at the moment from, from oil exports. They're not spending it very well. I mean, they're buying expensive imported cars. And they're not really dealing with the fundamental, if the price of oil were to fall back to $60, $70 a barrel, I would say that Russia would be in very great difficulties very, very quickly. So to answer your, your point, I mean, I, I think America has tremendous fundamental strengths, which people underestimate. You know, firstly, it's the only major power in the world with a well-balanced demographic structure. You know, people don't seem to be aware of this, but China's workforce is going to peak in absolute numbers in seven years' time, roughly, 2015. And then it's going to start declining, and it'll be an accelerating decline, and it'll go into the fastest demographic collapse ever seen by any major nation in peacetime. China is going to face this crunch, demographic crunch, before it ever gets rich. Japan is already now in its third year of demographic contraction. The population is falling. But at least Japan is rich. It's got huge savings. China is going to hit this crunch before it gets to that point, before it's developed a, you know, a modern welfare economy that's capable of looking after people you know, through their old age and so forth. It's, going to be, it's really quite a serious threat they're facing. You know, so um, I don't see any rising power that can challenge America. I, I mean, I believe that the, tw the 21st century will be the American century, just like the last one was. I certainly, Europe can't. Um, Europe is to a great extent an old age uh, people's home as well. I mean, if you look at Spain, Italy and Germany, they've all got contracting populations or, or will do very soon. They're on a trajectory for a very sharp fall. Some of them will, will shrink by a quarter to a third by, you know, over the next 50 years. And countries with, with that kind of population shape, graying, aging countries, are not dynamic. They're inherently uh, status quo countries that try to just preserve what they've got. They're not very inventive, not very creative. And I think this is, this is America's trump card. And on, and on top of that, people forget that, you know, you may be importing a lot of oil right now, but you are the Saudi Arabia of coal. You're the Saudi Arabia of, of food production. You know, you're a massive producer of grains and livestock. If you want to play a, a commodity game in the world, ultimately America can compete extremely successfully on that, on, that, uh, on that playing field. To play the devil's advocate on the point of us having a demographic 